Father, we thank you for this chance to be together again tonight. I thank you for uh, the time that each person has taken out of a very busy schedule, a very busy life to be here tonight. I pray that you might help us as we uh, put some things together about the book of Revelation and that we might grow in our understanding of you and what you want to see in our lives as we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. So how are you doing since last week? Anybody have any, just before we even get started, anybody have any questions that were raised? I know of one. Why so seven churches, right? That was a good question. Uh, we'll get to that one. Any others? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> the seven eyes and the seven wings and everything. In, in chapter one, you already see a lot of that. Chapter four, chapter five. Uh, we're talking about, of course, the picture of Jesus is that he's like a lamb who was slain and has seven eyes and seven horns. Okay, remember, all of this language in the book of Revelation is symbolic. Everything stands for stuff. It's impossible to picture it and come up with anything that's even remotely something you can look at. I've seen pictures, Google it online, look up lamb that was slain, and you'll see a lamb, a sheep with seven eyes. It looks like a spider, frankly. I mean, with eyes all over the place. That's not what John was trying to bring out. What he was trying to say was the number seven, you know what it stands for? What's that? Completion, fullness. So if you had, you add the number seven to your ability to see, and that means you can see everything. That's what that means. When he talks about seven eyes, he's not saying that Jesus had seven eyes or does have seven eyes, but that he can see, uh, he can see everything everywhere. The Holy Spirit is referred to by what number? Seven. The seven spirits. Well, there aren't seven Holy Spirits either, but rather it's a way of saying that the Spirit fills the entire world as God's presence. Uh, horn. The horn was a, a, a symbol of strength in the Bible. If you look all through the Psalms and all through the Old Testament, Remember that, might have remember that phrase, the horn of my salvation, God is the horn of my salvation. That doesn't mean the horn in your car. It's referring to a, a bull with those horns, which would be the one part of the bull you wouldn't want to mess with, because uh, all that strength is concentrated in those horns. Same like with, you know, hunting today, you go for a deer with, with, with massive antlers. It was a sign of strength and power. And so when the lamb is pictured having seven horns, that means complete power. A little later on, we're going to see a seven-headed monster, which was very, which, which was something that no, all the cultures of that world had as their sort of maximum evil thing. It was a seven-headed monster because it was completely bad. Like, you couldn't be worse than if you had the seven heads all coming at you at one time. Great. Is that making any sense? Yeah. It's... Um, we are so literalist. In our, the way we, we, we think that if it says it, then we have to be able to see it and draw a picture of it. And yet, really, these are mental pictures that are meant to um, help us just sort of get the message of, of where those symbols are going. Um, let's see, Wendy, you had a question last week about why the seven churches. Uh, okay, if you have a map in your Bible that has a little thing about Revelation, you'll find that it, all seven churches are in one very localized area. It, I'm sure it's an area smaller than the state of Vermont, maybe the size of the state of Vermont, something like that, in what we would call Turkey, Western Turkey, on the part facing over toward Greece. And uh, some scholars believe that the churches, and even the way that they're named, represents the trade route. The, the, the order of the churches was the way that you would take the road if you were traveling among these places, perhaps doing uh, commerce, or if you were a prophet. Like John, you were traveling from church to church, you know, so that you would get the most out of your trip. So the letter would presumably then go to church one and then down to two, three, four, and make the complete circuit. Now, the, again, what's the number seven stand for? Completeness. So seven churches is not just seven literal physical towns in Turkey, but refers to the whole church. But John's way of talking about that is to get very specific so he's talking to these seven congregations, and if we had the time, we could go in and look at how each one of them had unique, well, we did a little bit last week, had unique issues, unique problems that it needed to overcome. And then we can kind of pull back from that and say, oh, well, you know, that's kind of true in our world, too. We talked last week about how some Christians are facing persecution right now 
Others are facing complacency. Others are facing temptations to worship the gods of our age. Any more questions? These are great. I know you don't have it all figured out. You know, nobody wants to. But if there's anything that you came across in your reading where you said, boy, I didn't even get close to that. Yes. Bible? Okay. In the Bible, yeah. Yeah, the number seven is the number of completion from Genesis chapter one. How many days for creation in the story? Seven days. God rests on which day? Seventh day, right. All the way through to the book of Revelation. And just a little hint to you, the book of Revelation has more references to the Old Testament than any other book in the New Testament. It is saturated with Bible references. It literally is like a sponge. Anywhere you squeeze it, little verses or bits of verses come popping out because John was a Jewish Christian prophet. Okay? He would have seen himself as a Jeremiah or an Isaiah or an Ezekiel. And he, he was saying when he called himself a prophet, he was standing in line with them. And so everything he says comes out of those books, has, a, has a connections with those books. Uh, it's endless. I mean, you can read the book of Revelation and read your Old Testament, read it back and forth a hundred times, and you're still going to be saying, oh, look at that, because somehow he, the God just gave him the ability to tie so many strands together. So, yes, number seven is, is the, uh, the number, is basically the, probably the most important number in the Bible. Now, in the book of Revelation... When this comes back to the sermon uh, last Sunday. The number four represents the earth. You can just kind of almost bank on that all the way through the book. So there are four living creatures that stand around God's throne, the closest beings to God, and they are part, they represent his creation. You may remember in chapter four, there are these four creatures, they have wings. They had a face like a man or like, a, like an eagle or like an ox or like a lion. They represent um, kingship, if you will. The lion is the king of beasts, right? The ox or the bull w would be the strongest of the cattle. The eagle, the king, if you will, of the, of the, of the birds. And humans uh, are themselves sort of the rulers of, of the creation on God's behalf. So why would they have wings? The, the winged part makes them heavenly. The things we recognize, a, a human, an eagle, an ox, or a lion, they represent the earthly part. So these are hybrids of heaven and earth. Now, next week, we're going to be in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and we're going to meet horrible hybrids that are a mixture of heaven, of earth and hell. These are earth and heaven. And everything that's true about heaven tends to get mimicked by hell. So that you have a, a trinity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A little later on, we're going to discover a ho the holy trinity of the dragon, who is Satan, and the beast uh, from the sea and the beast from the land. So what, what John is doing is he is saying, you have to choose which God you're going to serve, the true one or the copycat. So now, you, so we have these four living creatures. Number four is the, the number of the earth, and they are the closest things. Then you have 24 humans. You have a multiple of four going on there, obviously, representing Old and New Testament. Twelve tribes, twelve apostles. The number three is the number of heaven. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, angels cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and so on. So we're going to find that there are these two these two numbers, that what happens when you add four and three? You get your seven, and that gets you back to, that's the sum of all things, you might say, in the, in the sort of code, not code language, but the symbolism of the book. So a couple of numbers stand out. What happens when you multiply four and three? And you get 12, which is the big number for the tribes and for the 12 apostles and so on. Now this may sound a little hokey, but they did stuff like this back in those days. They, they were fascinated with how numbers 
work to what happened when you put them together. And um, so some of this is going to carry over uh, as we kind of go through the book, kind of give you a little bit of a grid where we're going. I even find this number four, there are four winds, and there are four angels who hold the four winds, four corners of the earth, and the human race is described in four terms. Every what? People, language, tribe, nation. And sometimes it won't be one of those, but it'll be nation and kingship or whatever. But it, is, it typically is described, I've been checking it out as we've been going along, in terms of four. So it just kind of orients us that, God, God's, that John is talking about the earth. Now, in, the, in this part we're studying tonight about the seals you know, on, this, on the scroll, the first four are represented by four horsemen. And all of the things that happen with those four horsemen happen right here on earth. In fact, they all happen, for the most part, because people do them to each other. So it's a very human, earthly part of it. Now, what happens with the, the, the last three is the perspective tends to shift over more to the spiritual side or even the heavenly side, or at least, at least the supernatural side. So John is kind of helping us understand where he's going as we kind of go along. Is that making sense? Now, I'm not trying to be too too weird about all this, but at least I think these numbers are pretty solid. I'd like to uh, pass out some stuff to you tonight. Oh, oh, thanks. You can take out on one side. Maybe we get a couple of people to help us here. And maybe, yeah, you go there, and then we'll pass those back there. We have a chart here. One of my goals for us as we get together on this Wednesday night is to go a little deeper, kind of talk about things that won't make it into a sermon. A sermon is to the best of my ability, 30 minutes on one subject. And as you saw on Sunday, we covered four chapters in 30 minutes, so we didn't have time to dig in too much. But I thought maybe this would be really helpful to you. It's this is one of the most helpful things that I found in my study of the book of Revelation and also for other parts of the Bible. So what you have on this paper, the color picture there, is a depiction of how ancient people in the Bible and in other parts of that, of, that, uh, of that time in the ancient Near East, how they saw the universe. Okay? This is how they saw the world. And we'll take a couple of minutes to talk about it. You can ask some questions if you want. And if we can kind of understand this, then a whole lot of things make sense when John is writing or even when you're reading other parts of the Bible. Uh, the way they saw the Bible, the way they saw the world, was that the earth was like a disk resting on immense pillars, the pillars of the earth, that went down and anchored it as it floated on a vast abyss of water. All around it, around the earth, the water came all the way up to the surface, and they called that the oceans. So there was water under the earth, and there was water all around the earth. But God created dry land out of the midst of that as a place where people could live and farm and hopefully be safe from the water. When Noah's flood, when the flood took place, it, you remember how it says that the fountains of the deep broke open? What they imagined was that the water came up from underneath and covered up the earth. Now, even in the Genesis story of creation, First, God creates light. Then the second thing he does is he creates the sky. And they pictured the sky, something like this ceiling here, as a dome. They usually thought of it as a hard dome, like a, like a surface, a hard surface, obviously too far away for anybody to reach. And on it were lights that moved across it, the sun, the moon, the stars. So when you read about the firmament, remember that word, the firmament, or the sky, they thought of it as a dome. And beyond it was water that was separated from the earth. Remember how in the creation account it says God separated the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament? Well, that's because they, they thought of water being up there. Obviously, water had to come down from somewhere. And then they thought of windows in that dome, which the Bible calls the windows of heaven. So when you read and it says God will open up the windows of heaven, they were thinking that God who lived beyond that water up there would very graciously open up the, you know, move, open the windows and let rain come down. Now this is just, this was a very practical view of the world. They weren't trying to do science here. 
They, weren't, they didn't have any notion of orbital dynamics or, or whatever. I mean, to them, they, they just saw that the world looked like it was flat, and they thought of the mountains as, as holding up the dome on either side, and then the, and God, or if they were pagans, the gods, were somewhere up there on the other side of that dome. And down below was this place called Sheol, where the dead went, because obviously you buried people. And beneath that was this abyss, A-B-Y-S-S, the abyss, which was the source of evil. Now, they had a very negative view of the ocean. They saw the ocean, the sea, as the place that evil came out of. So you're going to see in the book of Revelation that when the really bad guys show up, they show up by coming out of the sea. John will see a beast or a monster coming out of the sea. You know, it's so different from our point of view. You know, we want to go to the ocean to relax and, and you know, watch videos of people diving and all that stuff. To them, the ocean was unpredictable. It was chaotic. Some people went out there and risked their lives. But, boy, you think of the weird things you can pull out of the water. You know, all these weird fish and various creatures. And they thought, well, that's just the place where the bad things are. And so when Jesus calmed the storm, he was taming the darkest forces of evil on the planet. When he walked on the sea, he was acting as king over that untamed realm. When God broke wide open the Red Sea and brought his people through, he conquered that last <laughs> form of, of, of chaos and evil. You see, th those are powerful things for them. I mean, we're sitting there wondering about whether it was a 20-knot or a 30-knot wind that was pushing water around. They were thinking in a totally different realm. They were thinking about God having victory over the, the darkest evil forces in our world. So I take some time to explain this because at the very beginning, we find that John, chapter 4, was in the, sp was in the spirit, right? And he was told to come up here, and a door opened in heaven. Well, presumably the door was the door through the dome that would let him out of this earthly realm and into the place where God was. Okay? So, is any questions at this point? Is that making any sense at all? All through your Bible, you're going to find that this is how they pictured the world. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Okay, so that's where we are. Then it says, for he founded it upon the waters. Now, what does that mean, founded it upon the waters? Well, in their worldview, the earth was on top of the waters. And so that's just like one little tiny example. You'll find them all over and over. You read the book of Job and about the storehouses of the snow. Well, God's temple, God's palace was up there, and Job is envisioning as if God has the all of the things that come down on earth as weather, all stored up there. And then when he chooses to, he, he releases them. And so the, the Bible is basically kind of showing us God is king. He rules over his world. And then humans are placed down here in a place where they are to rule uh, on his behalf, and uh, worshiping him. The story of the Tower of Babel was a story, in a sense, of an attempt to kind of break through, right, and say, hey, we can go where the gods are, something humans have been trying to do all along, is to just rebel against God versus worshiping him. Any questions? Any comments? Let me see if I left anything out there. I think we're covered pretty, mu pretty much of the stuff here. So when... Um, when we read about creatures coming out of the abyss or when these dark creatures that, that come and invade the earth, they're, com that they're coming up from underneath as, the, as was envisioned. Uh, don't try to figure that out in terms of, like, well, the earth has a molten core. That's not the whole point that we're talking about here. This is rather a kind of symbolic way of seeing the world that uh, helped them sort of know where they were and where everything else was. Uh, another example of this is in Philippians chapter 2 where Jesus is being acknowledged as king of kings, and it says, every knee shall bow. And do you notice how Paul says it? Where, where, do, they, where do they bow? On heaven, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. Because they would have seen the spiritual reality, which we would believe too, the spiritual reality is that there are 
There's a heavenly realm. There's certainly a dark, demonic realm that influences this world in ways that we don't immediately see. And then there's, of course, the realm that we live in ourselves. Uh, so this kind of helps us sort of maybe figure out some of the geography of the book of Revelation as we're going along through it. Now, the, the U-shaped plot that we're talking about, the U-shaped plot, remember last week, I think your next page will go there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the third page. The third page kind of captures for us everything that we talked about on Sunday and that you're going to be sort of studying a little bit t tonight. Okay, so it starts in heaven. And then we're going to go to earth, where we are, where humans are. And um, we don't, in this cycle, go into what we might call the abyss. But I'll just give you a heads up. If you're reading, if you start reading tonight or tomorrow or whatever, and you go into chapters 8 through 11, you're going to start finding that the real source of evil is not just bad people or people doing bad things. The real source of evil comes from those dark forces, uh, Satan and his emissaries, who are invading God's creation uh, from underneath, as it were. So we start here with chapters 4 and 5. These are the most powerful pictures of the presence of God and the throne room of God anywhere that I can know of in the Bible. And again, you can find lots of connections with Old Testament visions of God. But John puts them all together, worship songs. I mean, you could just sort of live in those chapters. And then what happens is, as we get into chapter 5, we learn about this scroll and that nobody can open it. The scroll has within it this plan that God has to rescue his world and bring it back to where it was meant to be in the first place, his new creation. A new heavens and a new earth. Everything about the book of Revelation is about God getting us from here to here. Especially about picking us up here where we are, stuck in this world, and moving us out of that sin and out of the influence of the dark forces and getting us into the new creation. The whole book is doing that. And the whole book is about you and me taking that journey and about us taking a stand against the things that would keep us here or would pull us down and it's about us being a light to other people so that they could take that journey as well. It's a very practical, practical book. It's as practical as whatever you're facing in your life today that isn't working because that's part of the old broken creation. So when, when John hears about the scroll, he weeps because nobody can open it. We don't even know what it says yet, but nobody can even open it, which says creation can't fix itself. How many of us have tried? <laughs> we can't even open the book, much less do the, the actual work. You know, it's sort of like saying, I need to take my appendix out. I can't even start the operation, much less fix the thing. You know, I need somebody else to come and help me, and that's where Jesus steps in. Jesus has the authority to do this because he's taken this journey. Not just because he's God, but in a unique way, because he came and went through death and then rose again. So Jesus' journey is our journey. And we know it works because we see Jesus on the other side of it. So then we have the seals, and you saw them one, two, three, and four. And you can read through them. Uh, they are things that happen on the earth. And it's at the end of those which get us down to where we're in the yucky, messy world that we know that we get to number five, which is the how long seal. That's how I kind of think of it. And here we meet Christians, people who are wanting to follow God and have been severely, in this case, actually martyred for their faith. Not going well. In fact, they're huddled under the altar, and they're saying, God, when are you going to fix the world? So hang on to that, because I'm going to just kind of finish up here in just a minute, but I want to show you Christians in three places, and then we're going to break out into our groups, and you can kind of process that a little bit. So here you have Christians in that place where, wow, God, how is this going to work? Now, the sixth seal is where 
where the story starts to go back up. And we see that we're not going to stay here forever. God judges, which means God makes things right. God says, okay, no more deception, no more of, this, of these dark things ruling the earth. I'm taking charge. And so that turns the corner. Something has to happen. You know, when you're going down, something has to happen to bring you back up again. You don't just, what do we say? What goes up must come down. But that doesn't say what goes down must come up. Something has to change. You think about what happens in your life. When you, oh, I, we were joking around the other day, or just maybe a, oh, half an hour ago, I was joking around with, with, um, with Becca about you come home and everybody's had a great time in the house and the house is a mess from one end to the other. How long will it stay like that? Yeah. Somebody has to say it's judgment time. Not in a bad way, <laughs> but we're going to fix this. And we start cleaning it up. And this is, this is the point of the book of Revelation, is that we find ourselves at that decision, am I going to stay in the mess or even make it worse, or am I going to be part of the solution? John, but John, what John does is he makes us go into the mess. Did you ever, when you had a kid had a messy room, did you ever say to the kid, no, 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 no. come here. Come here. And you stand there, and you know, the floor was long, was gone about a week ago. You know what I mean? It's just covered with stuff. And we, you just have to look at it. And then you have to go wade into it if you're going to fix it. You can't just snap your fingers and all the socks jump in the drawer. So John is saying to us as Christians, come with me on a journey. I'm going to take you and show you how bad the mess is. And we're going, no, oh, no, I don't, no, no, no. He said, no, you have to see this or else you'll, become complacent, or you'll give up when the pressure's on, or you'll start worshiping the wrong things. Now, this vision of what's wrong is the mildest of the three. Next week, we're going to take the same exact trip. We're just going to see it with x-ray vision. We're going to see, see it is even worse than this. And the third time is just unbearable. With the bowl, when the bowls are poured out near the end of the book, it's just unbearable. It, it, if it gives you the creeps, John goes, you got it. You ought to be revolted by how bad this world is without God. It's worse than it, we ever want to admit. It's worse than we think. In my mind, it's, it's almost like he rubs our noses in it, not to be cruel or mean or sadistic, but just to say, you have to get this. You have to see how bad this is. You can't minimize this. I mean, we're reading about Ebola right now, right? Uh, ten particles, ten. You can't even see them. You never uh, ten little virus particles take a person right out of here. Well, you can imagine doing seminars on this with medical personnel or whatever, and the doctor is just trying to get across them. Do you get how bad this is? <laughs> this this isn't a science experiment. This is this is for real, and that's what John's trying to do. He's saying this world is corrupted. So he turns the corner, and at this point, an interesting thing comes up. Another number. 144,000. How many of you have heard at least one theory on who the 144,000 are? <laughs> Maybe somebody knocked on your door and explained to you about the 144,000. <laughs> it's a symbol. It symbolizes God's people. Twelve tribes. It's all spelled out. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. You read them all. You read them all. That's just Old Testament coming into New Testament. John's saying, this is the people of God. And whenever they're counted like that, it's because they're an army, which means they have a mission. They're not just hanging around. They're not just sitting around. And they've been sealed. That's that Passover thing. And so John kind of shows us that, doesn't tell us a whole lot about that. Next week, he's going to tell us wh what their mission is. And then he concludes by saying, I, I heard about this 144,000, but I saw a multitude multitude that you couldn't count. These are one and the same thing. Two different ways of talking about God's people. You and I are that 144,000 in this generation. We're God's people in, con in continuity with Abraham and all of the Old Testament story and with Jesus who was obviously Jewish and right up through to ourselves. But we're also not limited by a number. 
the number is useful to help us connect with the Old Testament, with the tribes of Judah, but we're the multitude that no one can number. Do you know what the promise God made to Abraham was? His seed, his children, would be a multitude no one could number. So as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky, that's why, again, this is saturated with Jewishness. That's why it's a multitude no one can number. Abraham's promise has come true. The covenant's come true. And, and John is saying, and all of you, regardless of your ethnicity, you're part of that. Isn't that cool? It just connects all the dots for us. So we want to just, w when we're going through this part of Revelation, we want to keep moving. We've got Christians here. We've got Christians here. Christians here. This is the Christian before, the, you know, in the midst of the mess that, w that we experience in life. This is when we come to realize God's got an assignment for me, and this is our future. That one day we will be joined before, in, in heaven itself, before God. All of this will be behind us. So sometimes you're going to feel like you're here. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're here. You're probably always going to be wishing you were here. But John is saying, hang on. Hang on, because it's a journey to get there. And you're right in the middle of it. God's taking you there. Is that making sense? Now, if we get this down this time, then next week... We, it's the same thing, uh, different trumpets instead of seals and different ways of talking about God's people, but it's exactly the same thing going forward. So this really kind of clears up a lot of the getting lost on a rabbit trail, shall we say. So um, on, the, on your page four, you have some questions. I tried to make them a little shorter. We're going to divide up in our groups. What I would like for the groups to do this time those of you who are leading a group, if the group is uh, more than four or five of you, uh, try to maybe have the group divide up into groups of four or five so that when people share, they can get around the circle together, okay? One question for each group to maybe kick around just for a couple of minutes, and that's the question of what do you think God is saying to us as a church? Remember, these are letters to churches, not just to us as individuals. So I'd like you to kind of play with that, and each week I'm going to be kind of coming back to that because maybe somebody from your group can scribe out some things that you sense the Lord was saying to us as a church. And I'd like to get those back and bring those to the, ch to the elders, talk about them together uh, as we go through this journey together so that we don't miss God speaking to the church in St. Albans, right? To the church in St. Albans, I say. <laughs> what do you want to say to us, Lord? Uh, then we have three questions. They all kind of go together. A how long moment, in, how long, Lord, moment in your life in what way is that connected to this world being a mess? And where, where is Jesus leading you? So y you may or may not get to all of that, but let's divide up at this time. And um, uh, I, I really want to encourage you to have some prayer time. I'm going to catch you right before 8 o'clock and, and uh, remind you to have some prayer together. So just divide up if you would, and, we'll, um, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a signal to pray in just a minute. Again, break your group down so people get a chance to share.